So we're going to talk about um, Letitia Marion Hamilton and um, Snow in County Down. But before that, of course, we'll, we'll look at some of her other work. And I suppose what really struck me as I was, you know, preparing for today was um, how atmospheric her, her work is. I became really conscious of it, you know, as I was looking at her work over the last couple of weeks. And she very often captures uh, something of the essence of a place when she paints it. And it's more than, you know, the physical outline or weather conditions, and it's more than light. And I think it's, it's particular to her landscapes and arguably more so in her Irish landscapes. Um, somewhat similar to her distant cousin, Rose Barton, Hamilton's background is an important factor in the art she produced. She was called May by her family and she was born in 1878 and lived right through from the last quarter of the 19th century to 1964. The Hamiltons had been in Scotland for 300 years prior to Hugh Hamilton's arrival in Ireland as part of the plantation of Ulster. And then in 1616, he became a denizen of Ireland and settled in County Down. And you'll see that that's you know, quite significant in the way they lived their lives for generations afterwards. This is uh, Letitia in the walled garden of Hamwood House. Charles Hamilton I, a descendant of Hugh, along with his wife, Elizabeth Chetwood, built Hamwood House. It was completed in 1777 and it's remained in the family over the past two and a half centuries. And the name came from the amalgamation of the, uh, the surnames of the couple, Ham Hamilton and Chetwood. Uh, Charles Hamilton became the agent for the Duke of Leinster at Carton, and that position was again retained by successive generations right up into the 20th century. Letitia was born and raised in Hamwood, and she was one of a large family. There were six girls and originally four boys. Two of the boys died in infancy. Her paternal grandfather was a keen amateur painter, but in fact, there were painters and uh, garden designers and you know, artistic people on both sides. And so she inherited her talent from both sides, as did her sister, Eva, her older sister, Eva. Eva was the eldest of the six Hamilton sisters. And she began to study at the Metropolitan School under William Orphan in 1907, when she was actually 31. So she, you know, she wasn't young going in as a student. And she then went to the Slade under Henry Tonks. In fact, I think when she started to study under Orphan, she would have been younger because Orphan and Letitia Hamilton were born in the same year. So I think that she, she would have been older than her, than her teacher. Letitia was educated initially at Alexandra College and then like her sister, she also went uh, to the Metropolitan School under Orphan. She was a bit younger. She was in her late 20s when she went. And um, she then went on to uh, London and she possibly trained at the Chelsea Polytechnic. Uh, and she may also have studied with Frank Brangwen, but there's no uh, real evidence of her doing either. Uh, Stephen Odlum, who um, brought out a book in uh, just last year, 2020, uh, I'm just looking at the name here, uh, Eva Letitia and the Hamilton Sisters, Class, Gender and Art. And um, uh, he claims that uh, Frank Brangwen was not attached to any art school as a teacher, but he did exhibit with the Watercolour Society of Ireland in 1911 and 1912, and he may have met uh, Hamilton at that stage. So, um, Interestingly, she seems to have exhibited her work prior to her training at either the Metropolitan School of Art or anywhere else. Uh, she exhibited with the Watercolour Society from 1902 to 1964, so that's an astonishing 62 years. And her early work is said to be similar to that of Mildred Ann Butler, but not many watercolours have come to light as yet. She exhibited with the Royal Hibernian Academy from 1909, so around the period that she actually began with Orphan in the Metropolitan School. And she uh, exhibited right up to 1964, the year of her death. She was elected a full member in 1944. In the 1920s, she exhibited a number of times at the Paris Salon, as well as the Goop Hill Gallery, the Walker Gallery, the International Society of Sculptors, Painters and Gravers, 
the Royal Society of British Artists and the Scottish Society of Women Artists in Edinburgh. And from 1922, she exhibited at the Royal Academy in London, and then in 1930 at an exhibition of Irish art in Brussels. She was also one of the founder members of the Society of Dublin Painters in 1920, along with Grace and Paul Henry and Jack B. Yates, Mary Swansea, uh, many jealous Harry Clark and others. And of course, their aim was to provide a platform for modernist art. And when the Irish Exhibition of Living Art exhibitions began in 1943, Hamilton exhibited with the group uh, from then up until 1950. But by the 1920s and coinciding with her involvement with the Society of Dublin Painters, she was showing an interest in light and shade and texture. She didn't date her work. And given that she returned to some places and scenes you know, over her long life, it can be difficult to trace the development of her style. Impasto and pastel colours characterise some of her later work, but again, this isn't always the case. Odlum has attempted to date some works by cross-referencing uh, catalogues from exhibitions and newspaper articles and so on uh, to, to try and, and uh, date some of them. This scene, uh, the Irish market scene, has been dated to around uh, 1923. And uh, you can see here that it is uh, painted in an impressionist style and you have light you know, falling on particularly this house here in the center and then the shadow, the shaded area under the eaves. And uh, again, you know, patches of light on, I don't know, maybe pieces of material in this, the market stalls here and here, and also in this sort of rough foreground um, here and on the patches on the on the cow and on uh, the I think they're all donkeys although the, the these two in, in the here in the front could possibly be goats but there are you know patches of light uh, can be seen throughout this uh, is dated later this is 1925 to 31. Um, but it could be assumed to be an earlier painting than the one that we just saw, the Irish market scene. Uh, you can see here there are really fine lines and, you know, uh, a lot of precision, uh, particularly um, in the, the parapet, the bridge, the parapet of the bridge. And again, um, the lines here on the roof of this car here and uh, all along the buildings here, she hasn't. This one at the back, um, I, I was particularly taken with, even though she hasn't, you know, um, done the fourth line of the rectangle, but there are very strong lines, even in this sort of background uh, building here. And yet uh, there are elements that are loosely painted. As you can see, the light um, of a wet gray day in York and the light is reflected on the wet surface of the, of the, um, the bridge. Lights from um, the cars and uh, you know the, the traffic that's crossing the bridge, but also the the grey of the of the sky is reflected. So it does look in some ways like uh, an earlier painting than than the one before. Um, this of course is very different light. Uh, this is um, Venice prior to the outbreak of World War I. She frequently traveled uh, in France and in Belgium and the Netherlands. And from 1923, she regularly visited Venice. She loved the light, uh, of course, in Venice. And she often painted the same scene at various times of the day. In 1924, uh, both Letitia and Eva exhibited 54 of their works at Seven St. Stephen's Green under the title Venice. So the exhibition was titled Venice. Odlum notes that attribution of the works is nigh impossible, and the catalogue did not indicate which sister had painted what. So, I mean, that seems astonishing to us. Thomas Bodkin's catalogue uh, has survived, and the notes in the margin were, you know, less than complimentary. He noted, quote, gondola bad, uh, bad perspective, shocking drawing. So he clearly wasn't impressed with, uh, you know, with what he saw. But in this painting here, she uses devices that uh, she used uh, again and again in her Venetian scenes. And as we'll see, she used them elsewhere as well. 
So of course, um, the the effect of light on water, um, but she often has you know high buildings on either side as she does here, and then some sketchily um, painted figures just to add interest to the scene. And she does the same sort of thing here high buildings on either side, the sketchily uh, painted figures and the reflection of, of um, uh, light on the water. Uh, this uh, bridge, um, I'm not sure if it's the same bridge, but she certainly painted a number of paintings of a pink bridge, one of them actually entitled uh, uh, Pink Bridge. Uh, this one is just a bridge scene um, in Venice. And this is a, a, a different uh, sort of Venetian um, uh, painting because of course it doesn't capture water or light on water, but there is bright sunlight, almost white light, as you can see, um, you know, streaming in through the opening in, in the colonnade there at the, at the bottom. And again, just there through, through the bottom. And again, uh, coming in, uh, filtering through the columns on either side. Um, she was interested and she was informed regarding Dutch art. And as I mentioned, she'd been to the Netherlands. And, uh, you know, maybe there are echoes of uh, Peter de Hook here, the 17th century Dutch master whose work is noted for um, uh, its interiors with, you know, open doorways to the world beyond. <clears throat> de Hook's interiors, of course, are not palatial and there is a moral aspect. Uh, to his work, which has no resonance in Hamilton's work, which he may have uh, drawn on, on his style. And then um, staying in Italy, uh, this is Fiesole Hill uh, from the 1930s. Um, and as you can see, this there is a clear change here. You know, this one is sort of easy to, you know, approximate the date anyway. Uh, but again, she uses a similar sort of composition because the hills on the left, um, you know, with this, whatever it is, some sort of structure here on the right hand side. And then she has this ribbon of either road or water, you know, flowing through or going through, um, you know, between in, in, uh, in this sort of valley between between the hills and the and the structure. And of course, again, the loosely painted figure. So she is maintaining the same sort of uh, composition, but of course the, uh, the use of the brush is entirely different. There are, you know, swathes of, of, um, of uh, color here uh, applied with, with, you know, an absence of the detail of some of the earlier works. Um, this is um, in the collection, the Hugh Lane collection. And the Hamilton family appears to have been a, a very close knit one. Their father wasn't keen on suitors for his six daughters and resources were kept for the education of the sons. Um, dowries would have been expected and these weren't uh, forthcoming. Only one of the um, sisters married, the others uh, lived together for most of their lives. And in the case of some of the sisters, that period was for more than 80 years. During World War I, Letitia volunteered as a nurse, but she apparently spent much of the time rolling bandages for the wounded. And at that time, the sisters lived in Port Arlington. They lived in, in uh, big houses in a number of different places, always renting uh, once they moved out of the, their home. Um, and during World War I, they lived in Port Arlington and Hamilton painted the town square and the boglands in the area. So as you can see here, uh, uh, there's a figure bending to pick, you know, the last sods of turf, uh, which presumably he's going to uh, pile on the on the turf creel. And again, here you can see the light uh, reflecting off the wet bog land. And that sort of confuses the scene because, of course, uh, when turf is cut, it's stacked and left to dry before it's drawn home. Now, it could possibly be the very last of the turf to be brought home, but the you know the the very wet surface of the bog might suggest otherwise. Um, as you can see here, she has very clearly delineated uh, part of the cloud. Uh, it's you know in some ways it's almost map like, but it is one of these very atmospheric work works. I think she really captures the the essence of of a bog and that slight eeriness. And you know, just a sense of a of a vast and ancient and timeless place that is 
you know, stretching to and beyond the horizon. Uh, this work came into the collection in 1937 and it was presented by Joseph Holloway, but it may have been painted during that earlier period uh, in the Midlands. The palette here uh, uh, in this painting, which is also in the in the Hugh Lane collection, is somewhat similar. You still have this sort of um, browny, taupey colours, but of course uh, here uh, you do have the blue sky. But again, she has done this, you know, very heavily um, outlined uh, um, uh, clouds. Uh, the trees too, of course, are, are very heavily outlined. And you can see the one on the right, uh, the trunk is very gnarled. And again, this is um, uh, something that she regularly did when she, when she painted uh, trees. But I think that the, the sort of muted palette, she cuts the, she cuts the view, you know, by placing the bridge here and the, the, the muted palette and, you know, the size of the trees, uh, the outlining of the clouds. It, 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 it's a really intriguing um, sort of uh, work. This um, is dated as uh, 1930 to 32. Uh, it's in the collection of the Ulster Museum. So it's slightly later than those World War I years in Port Arlington, and it depicts the square in nearby Monster Evan. But again, she frequently returned uh, to the same places and to subject matter, sometimes years apart. So um, I, although it seems later, uh, again, it, it, you know, uh, it, it may be something that she painted from memory. From 1922, uh, she visited the west of Ireland and in that year she spent <clears throat> some time in Sligo and she exhibited Sligo scenes at the Royal Hibernian Academy and the Watercolour Society of Ireland in that year. And she also travelled around Kerry and Connemara. In 1929 she first exhibited a Connemara landscape at the Royal Hibernian Academy and then when World War II broke out it became too dangerous for her to travel in Europe and at that point she again turned to the West of Ireland for subject matter. In the war years, she only exhibited paintings of Ireland. From 1942, Roundstone began to appear in her West of Ireland scenes. And that year, uh, 1942, she exhibited three Roundstone paintings at the Royal Hibernian Academy. And over the remainder of the uh, 1940s and throughout the 1950s, she continued to paint and exhibit uh, scenes of the village and surroundings. She actually painted Roundstone at least 14 times using different viewpoints and different times of day. She sketched outdoors and she would transfer the scenes onto a larger canvas in her studio, but she also used uh, photograph, photographs. And Odlum's book actually has a, a really lovely photograph of Randstone from around 1940. And opposite, he has placed uh, a painting of Randstone, um, uh, Hamilton's um, Randstone and 12 Pins, dated uh, 1942. But here in this work, uh, again, she has, you know, the tall uh, building on the on the left and uh, the ribbon of road, you know, uh, going into the distance. And of course, uh, uh, you know, a wall and a partial structure, which um, uh, is visible on the right hand side. So again, the same sort of composition as she used in Venice and elsewhere. There are some strong lines here, uh, again, along the parapet going along by the, by the coast. And uh, the title of the work, Soft Day at Ramstone, of course, is a, a, an Irish euphemism. And, um, it, you know, the, again, there are sort of some contradictions in that you can see there's a figure there in the centre uh, who seems to have an umbrella up. And we can see the, the rain um, on, on the street and the reflection of light. And yet the sea is a sort of um, turquoise colour. Uh, so, we, you know, there is this uh, interesting capturing of, of uh, weather conditions. And this uh, really beautiful work here, uh, a landscape with the 12 pins uh, forming the backdrop uh, to this really gorgeous scene. Her, her use of colour here is superb, just lots of blues and uh, the reflection of the, of the embankment um, down here in the, in the water. Um, and uh, then what is possibly um, a, a solitary uh, boatman uh, here. Uh, I, I, I 
really think there are possibly shades of, of the, the Burkean sublime here, Edward Burke's treatise, uh, Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful from 1757. Burke, of course, um, said that in painting, the artist could get across the notion of the sublime by showing the, the, the immensity of, of nature or the natural world. Uh, in contrast to the powerlessness or the helplessness of, of human beings. So this, you know, tiny, fragile um, uh, creature uh, uh, in a tiny boat set in this vast uh, landscape. Uh, the the colour scheme uh, is different to um, uh, Burke uh, suggested that, you know, lots of browns and those sorts of colours were suitable for the sublime. But um, I, I think that there is a sense of it here. Um, George Barrett's Paris Court Waterfall in the National Gallery, you know, is a good example of the, the sublime, uh, you know, the, the, the sense of the, the little figures in the glade and then the immensity of the, of the waterfall. Um, this one has, you know, the, um, the heavy impasto, impasto and, the, and the more pastel palette that's associated with her, her later work. She regularly spent time in Ahakista in West Cork and several paintings of the area resulted from those visits. And this is one of the paintings where, you know, she, she does, it, where it is uh, almost dateable by the texture and, and the palette. Um, her work uh, in this and the next work, which is uh, near Glengareth, uh, it's lighter than the palette used in her West of Ireland or her Midland uh, paintings. And again, with this one, um, I, I think it really captures the essence, the, the climatic conditions that make that area different uh, to the rest of the country. The, the resultant um, lush growth you know, of, of the particular climate can be seen there. And also in these two paintings, there's a nestling of the buildings. And there is something, and, and although I know that that type of architecture was seen throughout the country um, you know, uh, in, in earlier times, um, there is a sense of the sort of protection uh, that is afforded this area by the Gulf Stream. And uh, I, I think you can see it in, in these works. The sisters moved uh, a number of times, but from 1947, they lived at uh, Woodville, a large house in Lucan. Odlum notes that despite their straitened circumstances, they maintained the vestiges of what he describes as ascendancy, social mores and etiquette. So formalities associated with grand house life were maintained with regard to dressing for dinner, uh, for which a gong was sounded. And uh, for breakfast, they maintained the Scottish tradition of eating porridge standing up, uh, despite three centuries in Ireland. And that's why I went back to, you know, the 1600s, because it's just astonishing that they maintained uh, these, these traditions. The elderly sisters also had at homes on Sunday afternoons with tea and sandwiches and sponge cake and uh, served to the callers. And these apparently were very well attended and the women loved uh, having young visitors in, in particular. They regularly gave parties and each Christmas Eve they hosted a drinks party. And one regular guest noticed that uh, all of society came to these parties and Letitia, uh, wrapped in a fur coat and with blankets over her knees, would sit by the fire and uh, people approached, as Odlum said, to pay homage. They're described as having an eccentric lifestyle and among the, pe the peculiarities of their home was a large tree from which numerous umbrellas hung so as to resemble a fruiting tree. Among the family, their home was affectionately called the ant's nest. Um, the money they earned from painting, Letitia had a small income from her father's will, uh, but the money they earned from uh, painting and uh, their sister and from their sister's uh, sister Connie's um, earnings as a garden consultant, gardening consultant, that was pooled together for all of them to live to live on. Uh, but they also took in uh, paying guests uh, to make ends meet. And one of the uh, paying guests. 
uh, was given this and some other paintings. Uh, this view of Carrigart County, Donegal, with Errigal in, in, the, in the distance. So this uh, painting came up for sale in Sotheby's in 2019, and it had remained in the family uh, of the woman to whom it had been given uh, since uh, that time in, in Lucan. Um, but I was interested in the, uh, again, uh, the sort of composition here. And you'll see, um, as, as we look at the next painting, which is in the Hugh Lane collection, uh, similarities in the composition. This body, uh, body of water here, um, which is, again, you can see it here. Uh, this would appear to be a later work, uh, both you know, from the from the palette and and uh, the texture, um, but what interested me uh, in about this uh, particular one was the fact that you have this gully of water which appears to flow, you know, towards us, towards the spectator, and to to some extent, what that results in is that the the larger mass of water almost seems as if it's sort of uh, slightly suspended. Uh, uh, um, uh, that's just the, the, the perspective uh, once you look at the gully and see the water uh, flowing flowing towards us. Um, the online caption for the gallery quotes a critic, a critic who was unimpressed by her use of impasto and noted that Hamilton's excessive use of the palette knife, a predilection for the most sugary tones and a superabundance of white inevitably suggests the confectioners. But again, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting work, particularly because of the, of the uh, perspective. As I mentioned earlier, her, her background influenced her subject matter and she painted horses throughout her career. The Hamilton family loved horses and both Letitia and Eva um, hunted with the ward hunt. The term horse Protestant, of course, was used um, with, in reference to those viewed as the Anglo-Irish elite. And Hilary Pyle has referred to Hamilton as, quote, a typical horse uh, Protestant. Uh, this is uh, her painting of the Wicklow Hunt, uh, which is probably maybe slightly earlier than the other one. But she also did depictions of the Limerick Hunt, uh, Polo in Phoenix Park, and lots of other uh, horsey paintings. This is a study, uh, the Meath Hunt Point to Point Races Oil and Board, and it is most likely a study for the painting with the same title, which won a bronze medal at the 1948 Olympics. Hamilton was 69 years old, and she was the first and only woman artist to win a medal for Ireland. Jackie Yates, of course, had won silver in 1924 for the Lippy Swim. The medal winning painting was sold in 1989, purportedly to an American, and its whereabouts is, is unknown, um, according to Odlum. Odlum notes that her work was priced quite cheaply. The painting for which she won an Olympic medal was originally priced at £40, and that subsequently rose to 60 But male artists like Jack B. Yates and Paul Henry were commanding much greater sums uh, for their work. Odler remarks that with Irish independence, Irish women artists like the Hamilton sisters were doubly disadvantaged because of their sex and the perception of them as Anglo-Irish. And uh, um, that's a somewhat similar point or perhaps related to the point that Catherine Milligan observed about Rose Barton and other um, women artists from uh, the, the, what was perceived as an elite class. However, in 1922, Hamilton was among the artists chosen to represent Ireland as a newly independent state at the World Congress for, Irish, uh, for the Irish race in Paris. There, she exhibited West of Ireland uh, scenes and Sligo. And again, in 1930, uh, in Brussels, she was chosen for the exhibition of Irish art, on that occasion, uh, choosing to show French scenes. And then in 1933, her work was shown at the Chicago Century of Progress exhibition. And there was some controversy about subject matter for this exhibition with the government keen to show Ireland as modern and progressive. 
and they didn't want painting of cottages, which annoyed uh, Paul Henry greatly. And they also didn't want uh, scenic portrayals of what is now or was then and is still now, of course, the six counties of Northern Ireland. And it was stipulated that work by artists from Northern Ireland, um, James Humbert Craig and William Connor, should represent the free state. And some of you may remember uh, that some months ago when I gave a talk on William Connor's A Sup of Tea, I mentioned that he had rather strangely proposed showing a painting of an Orange Order March uh, on July 12th. Um, as a representative of Irish art, and of course it was rejected. Hamilton, in fact, didn't exhibit uh, an Irish scene. She exhibited French, a French scene and an Italian one. So um, I'm not sure why this happened, but perhaps the new state saw that her uh, continental travels uh, were evidence of sophistication, and maybe that's why um, you know, her, her work got through. She also took part in the Talton Games in 1924 and again in 1928, and she won medals in both. The Games had been revived in 1924 after um, uh, not being held uh, since Anglo-Norman times. So Hamilton, uh, whose identity was so bound up with uh, the Anglo-Irish and ascendancy life, um, did find a, a place uh, in the New Ireland. From World War II um, onwards, this isn't so you can see um, I, I, the the um, the bougainvillea, and there are touches of blue. I I think it's possibly um, oleander. Um, it's difficult to date, of course, the Andalusian uh, courtyard or this depiction of Dubrovnik because the style here, uh, particularly in this one, and indeed the palette, is not dissimilar to some of the Venetian scenes which were painted as early as 1923. Although I do think that in this one, there is some texture, so it's po uh, possibly later. And there's no mistaking uh, this. Um, this work was exhibited at the RHA in 1946, and uh, it has impasto with paint really thickly applied in some areas. And then there are other areas of the canvas where, you know, it's barely covered. Uh, and the style and the exhibition date stay, uh, would suggest that it, it's, it's painted in the mid 1940s. Um, so, Finally, to um, snow in County Down. Oh, this uh, oil on canvas uh, dates to 1937. And like Imani in Lavacore Under Snow uh, of 1881, also in the Hulane collection, Hamilton uses blue tints, uh, some in so these sort of rainbow shaped swathes, uh, I, I don't know if you can see, but uh, they're like swathes of, of paint across the, across the canvas. Um, she, and she uses this throughout the whites to, to capture this uh, winter scene and the effect of snow and light. And there's a real uh, feeling of weight uh, uh, in, in the way that she's depicted this um, shrubbery or uh, scrub growth uh, here on the right hand side you can feel that there's a heavy weight of snow in this and then of course uh, she captures the um the shaded areas on the uh, underneath uh, in, in where the snow hasn't reached in these sort of browny blacky um tones and those that those sort of brownish tones give a warmth uh, to the painting uh, which has so much blue and white and there are, you know, other touches of uh, warmth uh, in slight daubs of pink uh, around, um, particularly around here, and in a sort of golden colour uh, here and here and uh, some here and uh, again uh, uh, just around here. Uh, so that brings some warmth uh, to the scene. But again, with this one, it's more than just, uh, you know, a capturing light and, and weather. It's very, very atmospheric. There is a sort of a magical um, kind of enchanting uh, feel to it. And it's not uneerie. It's not exactly eerie, but it's not uneerie. And again, you know, we get this sense of the awesome uh, power of, of nature. And 
in in finishing uh, today's talk, we, we return to Letitia Hamilton's place in Irish art history. The online caption uh, for this painting notes uh, that the painting was, was purchased by the Haverty Trust, uh, in, which was established in 1930 to purchase work by contemporary artists for public collections. And that such a purchase marks her as an artist of importance. So um, while until Odlum's research, little has been done on Letitia Hamilton's work. And while in her lifetime and beyond, her paintings do not fetch the, the prices uh, which her male counterparts uh, fetch. Yet, she does seem to have negotiated her way through, through um, a life in Ireland, both privately and, uh, and in her work life. And she can you know, claim her place in, in Ireland and in Irish art history, uh, but more research uh, is needed and, and deserved.